Welcome to this presentation about uh, nose surgery and the damage you can uh, receive from that. I'm going to talk quite a lot about empty nose syndrome and here's an index. You can pause the video and find the most interesting parts you want to learn more about. In this video I'm going to talk about uh, nose surgery and specifically nose surgery uh, that's supposed to help you with nasal congestion. Um, I'm going to reveal the, the truth um, that's hidden from you, from doctors, from hospitals, from surgeons. And I'm going to start to talk about my specific situation and what happened to me, and what kind of damage I got, what kind of symptoms I have. And after that, I'm going to um, go into the scientific explanation a little bit more about this condition. So um, a few years back uh, I had some minor problems uh, with the congestion in my right nostril. Um, it wasn't really a big problem but I had this for a while. Um, uh, I wasn't congested all the time, I was congested um, sometimes, um, but uh, I went to see a doctor uh, to see if, it, if I could do something about it. Uh, and that was my uh, biggest mistake ever in my whole life. Um, after that, um, I went to um, x-ray. Uh, I was told I had a deviated uh, septum. Uh, I was told I needed to to operate on that, um, and um, I got um, quite a lot of problems straight away after. Uh, tremendous problems with my sleep uh, and dryness. Um, dryness wasn't too bad in the beginning, but it started to becoming slowly worse, uh, like every every year. So uh, after that, um, I went to have a private uh, x-ray done because the hospital didn't want to, to pay for one. Uh, and uh, then I realized that the surgeon just, he didn't only remove the, the, um, the septal spur I had. I had a septal spur in my septum. Uh, that was the reason for my deviated septum. <clears throat> but he also removed my turbinates. So after that, um, my life is uh, destroyed. Uh, my life is more or less over. Uh, I suffered tremendously. And um, after that, I have spent a few thousand hours of research into this condition. So that's why um, I think it's, it's a good um, thing to listen on me. Um, and uh, to hear my story and the reason why I'm doing this um, video um, it won't change my situation um, but my, my life is destroyed and uh, if that's not, not going to be in vain um, maybe I can help some, someone out there to rethink uh, if they really need to have this kind of surgery performed or if they can fix their uh, congestion by a diet change or something. Um, so it's, it's mainly a video for, for you who are thinking about having a surgery uh, for nasal congestion. Uh, it's also a video for people within the healthcare industry, um, within the healthcare system. Uh, I hope some of you can be open-minded to listen on the patient stories. Uh, I don't think the situation will change really because it's a it's a big um, how to say co corporation or uh, big machine behind all of this. It's companies that produce these medical instruments for surgery. There are education, big education that's is performed. A lot of people uh, open their private businesses here in, at least here in Sweden. 
to start to earn extra money on these kind of surgeries. Um, so of course, uh, this is going to continue and it's not so much we patients can do about it uh, more than just educate ourselves and this is what i'm going to try to to do here to educate you to learn you what will happen during these kind of surgeries um, and so on this is going to be quite a long youtube video so um, for you who don't want to listen to it and want to leave right now i just want to say one thing for you that's extremely important you have to understand this so a surgery to your nose specifically when it's about turbinates and septum uh, it's not only a surgery locally in your nose it's a surgery to your nervous system and to your brain so a surgery to your nose is not a local surgery only in the nose. It's also a surgery to your nervous system and to your brain. And that can cause tremendous problems. So stay a few minutes more and I will explain all of this. But first I'm going to tell you about my, my situation. I'm going to show you a slideshow here and explain everything in, in detail. Uh, unfortunately, some of this slideshow, uh, or most of it, is written in Swedish. And so, um, for you English-speaking listeners, um, you, we're not going to be able to understand everything, but I'm going to try to explain most of it in, in words. So, uh, before I start, I just want to say that, uh, uh, like I told you, this slideshow is in Swedish. Uh, so, for you who understand Swedish, um, you can just pause the YouTube video and you can read everything for yourself because I'm not going to read up all the pages, all the text uh, every time. So just pause the YouTube video and read it through. Um, yeah. So uh, like I told you, I went in to have a septoplasty surgery to my septum to correct the septal spur. Um, but the surgeon also removed my turbinates and here on the left side you can see uh, that's how my nose was before the surgery um, so here you can see the the inferior turbinate and the inferior turbinate on the other side uh, this is how it looks after uh, this is not all the sequence uh, sequence of course of my nose so it's totally empty in the first part here. Uh, you might see that on the other images. Uh, but like you see, here is my right nostril. Um, now after surgery, you can see the black area here is, is now completely open because of the uh, septoplasty and also of, because of the reduction of the turbinates. This is uh, x-ray uh, from below. So you can see my terminates here before the surgery were all the way uh, up to the front. So these are about five to six centimeters long in a healthy uh, adult uh, man. So after the surgery, uh, it's just this um, part that remains. Um, and here you can see from the side, this is how it was before surgery. Uh, this is the inferior turbinate. And this is after the surgery. Uh, I have got something that's called empty nose syndrome. Or actually I don't like uh, that name and I'm going to explain why. And I'm, I'm going to come up with another name later. Um, but to, to start with my problems. Uh, first, after the surgery, uh, dryness started to got worse like every year uh, and sleep got really bad uh, straight away after surgery um, so nowadays i i wake up um, i have I, I need to use sleeping pills like i've been i've been doing that for for years now uh, and even if if i use sleeping pills uh, i wake up like every two hours 
So I wake up and I gasp for, for air. Uh, I have um, a sensation of air hunger. Um, uh, I'm not relaxed with my breathing at all. Uh, if I look at my, uh, my watch, I can see that um, my pulse is too high. I can also see that um, I can also feel that my breathing is too shallow and a little bit too fast. It's not like hyperventilation, but it's it's too fast to have a relaxed breathing. Um, also, um, I have no natural um, air resistance in my nose, so the breathing feels. Um, stressful not relaxed at all sometimes i i need to put cotton inside the nose uh, to to make some more uh, air resistance um, and for you swedish listeners you can just read to this page and i'm going to skip for for the next one now um, yes i told you about the the dryness uh, and it's not like dryness on the skin and uh, when you have a little bit dryness on the skin it's not like that at all. Uh, it's the whole mucosa inside the nose. It's extremely painful. Um, you get sensitive to all kind of particles, to smoke, to dust, to um, yeah, anything that's... If, if, if I just walk inside a, a store where they have some um, products in plastic or rubber or... Uh, yeah other products, they give away some small, small, tiny particles into the air and, and those small particles, it's tremendously painful. Uh, it's not like before I could say this smell bad or this smell good. It's, it's not really connected to how I sense the smell. It's connected to pain. So for example, when I cook food inside the oven, there will be some small burned particles in the air and those are extremely painful in my nose. Uh, I also have nerve pain from this right nostril where I had the septoplasty perform, performed uh, and it shoot out in my uh, right eye and it got, gets a lot worse when it's cold. And the next uh, thing I have is um, when I'm outside, when it's below like a, around 12 degrees, I get uh, my nose like runs a lot. Um, it's extremely annoying and uh, I have discovered now it's because when you're outside when it's cold, your eyes produce more tears. And those tears, there are some small holes here um, and those uh, tears they drain inside your nose behind the front of your um, inferior turbinates uh, and on my left side uh, that hole that orifice of the tear drainage uh, there is no turbinate there anymore so it just flows straight out the nose Normally when you have the turbinate, it's like, you know, more or less like you throw a bucket of water onto a wall. It spreads like that. Uh, now it just comes straight out and it's nothing inside the nose that can like keep it there. And also I lost, um, how to say in English, I think it's, is it Silla? The small hairs on the turbinates that they do some rhythmic movement to to make the uh, mucus and everything and tears and everything to go backwards into the nose and uh, so so that function is destroyed on me uh, and it's uh, it's very annoying and the next uh, thing i have is um, when i'm outside when it's below like a, around 12 degrees I get uh, my nose like runs a lot. Um, it's extremely annoying, and uh, I have discovered now it's because when you're outside when it's cold, your eyes produce more tears, 
and those tears there are some small holes here um, and those uh, tears they drain inside your nose behind the front of your um, inferior turbinates uh, and on my left side uh, that hole that orifice of the tear drainage uh, there is no turbinate there anymore so it just flows straight out the nose normally when you have the turbinate it's like you know more or less like you throw a bucket of water onto a wall it spreads like that uh, now it just comes straight out and it's nothing inside the nose that can like keep it there and also i lost um, how to say in english i think it's is it silla small hairs on the turbinates that they do some rhythmic movement to to make them uh, mucus and everything in tears and everything to go backwards into the nose and so so that function is destroyed on me uh, and it's uh, it's very annoying yeah my sense of smell is also heavily reduced in my right nostril where I had the septoplastic performed. Um, the other nostril is more or less uh, the same. Also uh, I've got uh, a lot of problems with my eyes and I discovered now uh, it's because I've been using these sleeping pills for years now and those dry out the eyes. So I have some glands uh, coming down in my eyelids, they call them mambombian glands. Uh, when you use this kind of uh, sleeping pills, they affect um, a substance, a neurotransmitter that's called acetylcholine, acetylcholine, I think in English. Uh, it blocks that signal. So um, there are small muscles around the orifices. Uh, those muscles won't get um, the signal to open. So those glands become blocked and also the gland itself um, stops to produce good quality of uh, oil. So after a while that builds up a pressure uh, because the oil and the, yeah, the grease and everything doesn't come out. So after that those membomian glands they die. So that's not directly from the no surgery, but it's a secondary damage because I have been, I've been on these sleeping pills for, for years now. And I'm also extremely sensitive to particles uh, in the air, like I told you, and uh, the humidity. Before I could be in any kind of environment without any problems. I could be in dusty environments, in and dry and humid conditions uh, I wasn't affected at all so now I need at least above 35 40 percent of um, relative humidity um, if it's below that it's so painful in my mucous membrane inside the nose um, and yeah like I said, um, all smell, uh, everything, and and it's it's a big problem with the dryness sensitivity because you know when the sun shines in through windows, for example, it gets really warm quick and um, it dries out as well. So I now I had to put like uh, some protection on the windows, um, some sun sun protection film on the windows uh, also when i when i'm in in car especially on the summer uh, or when, when i'm in my camper it's so extremely painful because it gets so dry and warm um, so yeah it's it's so annoying and one people who don't have this condition can't really understand how uh, really uh, how annoying and painful this is and also I told you about uh, the sleep. Uh, I have really big problems with sleep and that's because I have this air hunger sensation. 
Uh, that's connected to the empty nose syndrome. I'm going to explain more about this condition later. Um, but I have this during the night, I have this during the day. And in my case, uh, I have some air sensation, some nerves in my left nostril that still work. So I can feel the breath inside my left nostril, but I can not feel it in, in my right nostril. When this nostril, the good nostril blocks uh, I get this air hunger sensation, some say suffocation, I think it's um, not the correct word for me really. It's more like air hunger, you feel stressed with your breathing, not relaxed. Um, you breathe and you breathe and you breathe, but you don't get the relaxing breathing. And as soon as my left nostril opens up, the, the good one, the good one because it's also damaged, but. Uh, as soon as uh, that one opens up, oh, my, my breathing comes down, I feel relaxed again, and yeah. So this is how I, I need to live my life now. Uh, I need to have the um, humidifier next to my bed. Uh, I put the hose here and so I can get the steam just on my face. And when I'm on the computer here now, I need to have a hum humidifier here as well. If I'm... Uh, out uh, for example on a bus or something and uh, it's summer it's dry it's warm uh, i need to use this kind of um, uh, it's also a humidifier um, um, gives you some some moisture or i use this mask uh, it like catches some of your the moisture when you exhale so it keeps that inside the mask and when you inhale again you you get that into your nose. So now you know about uh, my condition, and what happened to me. Um, so let's let's try explain a little bit for you who are going to do um, nose surgery what this is about. So uh, let's see here. These are the turbinates. You have one here. That's the inferior turbinate and you have a middle turbinate here and you have the superior turbinate up here. It's a really small one uh, and that's how they look from the side. This is another image. You can see them here. That's the lower one, inferior one, the middle one and I think the superior one is up here. Uh, this is how it looks from, from the front like that. So there are some bones some bone structure growing down from the skull like this. And that's surrounded by a uh, mucous membrane, membrane with a lot of blood vessels inside. And it looks more or less like this. Um, and this is an X-ray, you can see them. This is the inferior turbinate. And this is also how it looks like uh, inside the nose. And these are about the inferior turbulence are about five to six centimeters long. Here we have another image. Um, you can see them. They grow out on, um, on bone from the maxillary sinus wall here. And then they are surrounded by uh, mucous membrane and blood vessels. So in my case, uh, the surgeon have removed just all of this in the first like I say four centimeters of the nose, four, four and a half centimeters of the nose. So it's just a black hole here uh, in my case. So I'm now going to explain a little bit the functions of the turbinates. It's not all of the functions the turbinates have because it's, it's a lot of functions, but um, it's, it's a few of them. So first of all, um, they uh, there are some goblet cells on the surface of, of the turbinates and also on the septum and yeah all over the the mucosa in the nose uh, and those goblet cells they produce um, uh, how to say um, secrete that have uh, some active um, compounds uh, i'm not sure about the words in english I think it's lactoferrin or something and uh, lysosome uh, and also uh, IgG uh, antibodies and those substances uh, they are 
antibacterial. So they kill viruses and bacteria. And that's a really important part. Also on the surface of the turbinates you have these um, cilla, or small tiny hairs uh, I explained before. Uh, and they do some movements to make them secrete in the nose to go backwards so you can swallow it. Um, so you know the, the bacteria and everything or dust or pollution gets trapped on, in the mucus in, in the nose and those tiny hairs they pr produce these rhythmic movements to make it go down so it clears and cle it cleans the nose. And also uh, on the surface of the turbinates you have this um, uh, TRPMH, uh, it's written wrong here, it's TRPMH, and those are called thermoreceptors. And those are the same kind of receptors um, that you can sense yourself when you blow at your hand like that, it gets cold. Uh, and when, if, when you have a functional nose, you can also sense it's, it's a cool sensation when you inhale. And especially if you go outside, you can feel it. When you go outside on the autumn, when it's cold, and you think like, oh, what a fresh day. The air feels so fresh and uh, so clean and everything. You can't feel that. The only thing you feel is the temperature and it's those thermoreceptors and it's those thermoreceptors that are involved in empty nose syndrome and I'm going to explain way way more about this later. Also the turbines are uh, there to yeah to filter the nose from pollution like I told before they are also there there to heat up the air. Um, I have another image I can show you uh, and when you exhale uh, there are some um, some air, some some water, some humidity in the air that evaporates on the surface of the turbinates, and that air, uh, that water is like taken up again into the body, so it saves the body of water. The turbinates are also there to regulate uh, how much air. Uh, the lungs will receive and the body will receive. So when you're outside doing exercise, walking, being active, the turbinates are supposed to shrink down to allow more air to reach your lungs. And when you relax, sit down, when you are sleeping, those um, turbinates are supposed to swell up a little bit, not too much to block the, the nostril, but a little bit to reduce the um, airflow to make to, to cause more air resistance. And that's one important function because when you relax, when you sit down, uh, you should have more air resistance to get a calmer and more relaxed breathing. And when you remove the turbinates, that function doesn't work anymore. So you have a maximum flow all the time. Also the turbinates are there to for you to have something that's called a nasal cycle. Um, so it's basically a system where one turbinate swells up in uh, or, or the turbinates in one nostril swells up uh, while the turbinates in the other nostril shrink down. Uh, so this allow like the airstream to go from one side to another side and back to the other side. And this allow one side to rest, to produce more mucus, to, to heal itself from, you know, get some wear and tear from like constant breathing, you inhale dry air. So it allows one side to rest and it allows the other side to take over the process and you also allow some, some healing between. And when the turbinates swell up, it also produces way more uh, secrete of those uh, lactoferrin and uh, lysos lysosome uh, that I described, described before. So if you don't have the turbinates, both nostrils are always open at the same time. And you can imagine yourself like you get a lot of more 
wear and tear uh, on your mucous membrane. And also another function of the nasal cycle is it allow for a constant air resistance because one side swells up and more or less blocks the, the airflow totally and uh, the other side opens up so you have the the same air resistance uh, it doesn't matter if this side is blocked and that side is open or the other way around so it, it allows uh, one to have a a normal air resistance all the time so this is another function that is destroyed when you remove the turbinates so next image uh, this is the one i was talking about before and uh, how the turbinates work to increase the air temperature and um, so uh, if the air is for example here minus 12 degrees outside and have a humidity of 30 uh, percent it passes the the mucous membrane uh, and yeah it passes all the turbinates tissue here and when it reached uh, the, the back of the nose the throat uh, it's it's 25 degrees instead and have a um, relative humidity of 90 percent so of course when the turbinates are removed um, yeah this function is destroyed so you inhale cold air and um, it's not good for the lungs so let's talk about natural reasons for uh, nasal congestion uh, this is something that uh, the healthcare system the doctors they don't they don't tell you they don't tell about this because they want to continue to do their kind of surgeries so uh, you won't they won't mention this for you so uh, it's most most of the time f f if not all of the time is related to either allergy or food intolerances so it could be ige or iga uh, mediated um, allergy and then it's a fast reaction uh, if it's e g e or i g a it's like if you eat something you are allergic to for example a peanut and uh, you get a reaction in like five minutes like that so that's pretty easy to know most people know if they have some kind of al allergy the kind of allergy the healthcare system here in sweden uh, don't test and don't tell you about is igg mediated uh, food intolerance uh, allergy or yeah food in intolerances so uh, th it's it's a slow reaction in this case this could be from 12 to 36 hours or 12 to 72 hours actually if if i remember correctly so it's really hard to know if you have this kind of allergy or intolerance so if you eat something today you have antibodies antibodies against uh, you could have a reaction like uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow so um, this is a big reason for for nasal congestion so if you live in in sweden or in scandinavia i recommend you to to go out on on this site here amudomedical.se and here you can do a igg food intolerance test uh, i have no cooperation with this um, company so uh, I, I don't earn any money or anything to to say this i've done a test myself uh, because I had ulcerative colitis and that was the reason for my uh, nasal congestion I didn't know at the time um, so uh, I did a test and I, I, I got the list of uh, I don't remember exactly now what was like 12, 13, 14, 15 foods that I had antibodies to and I removed those food foods and I um, I healed myself from ulcerative colitis and I had ulcerative colitis for 10 years, 10 years. Um, 
and I tried everything, all the medicines and everything, uh, and it didn't help. But I removed those foods and it helped me. And that was 99% probably the reason to, to my uh, nasal congestion. Uh, it could also be histamine. Histamine is a natural substance that uh, we have in many foods and it's high concentration in like some caned foods, some where the food is a little bit, how you say, old. Um, so then it's, it, there is a process of where histamine is created. So cheese, for example, um, cane tuna is another example, and you can Google this yourself, uh, foods with histamine. Uh, histamine is uh, a thing that, uh, especially if you are in lack of one enzyme that breaks down histamine, uh, especially in that case, it will swell up your turbinates and cause one yeah inflammation or yeah inflammation in your body really so you can do one test for dao enzyme that's one enzyme uh, one should have to break down this histamine so it's pretty it's a pretty, pretty common reason for for uh, nasa congestion uh, also uh, if you have some kind of uh, inflammation in your body and um, it could be from autoimmune diseases like I had from ulcerative colitis it could be from Crohn's disease if you have some kind of um, uh, arthritis or yeah um, there are many kind of autoimmune diseases most of the modern uh, not acute diseases have some kind of uh, autoimmune component also, nasal congestions could be related to uh, the air quality. So if you live in a house where you have uh, mold, uh, where it's uh, dusty, uh, the air quality is bad, you have some substances that could be irritating the, the nose, and that could also be a reason for, uh, for nasal congestion. Um, and... Um, Food with um, inflammable substances. Um, you could read up this yourself because it's, it's too complicated and too much to explain in this video. Uh, but I cured myself from ulcerative colitis with diet change. Uh, so it's extremely important uh, to, to remove uh, those kind of foods if you want to remove inflammation in your body and just to say some uh, foods with uh, that, that triggers inflammation in your, in your body it could be milk products um, even if it is free of lactose uh, it could be wheat barley uh, rye for example uh, for some people it's uh, eggs um, nuts and seeds could be ir irritating for some people um, yeah it's it's a lot to read through so I'm, I'm not going to explain everything about that uh, there is one article and you can go out here and you can just follow this link um, so there will be more explanation about what kind of foods that affect uh, and contribute to to nasal congestion so now I want to talk a little bit about the information you get before the surgery. So in my case, I, um, I saw the doctor uh, and they sent me to one x-ray. And on the x-ray they, they told me I had a deviated septum. Uh, and I asked them, okay, um, um, do I, do I need to have surgery and what kind of complications can I get from, from that surgery and what risks are there? Uh, and they told me, well, there is only risk for bleeding during the surgery and for 
infection uh, just after the surgery. Uh, and on this document here, uh, uh, I've been making a screen screenshot on on that one uh, before the um, the doctors uh, had time to remove it. But on this side, on the on this document, you 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 can see that there is absolutely no communication about the risks. Uh, and for you who are uh, English uh, speakers, you won't understand this, but for, for the Swedish ones, you can read this through for yourself and you will see that there is no explanation about the risks. And this was the um, doctor who, who, made, um, who made me to have the surgery. And I asked him, his name is Bengt Nilsson Helger, and he works at Kalandeska uh, Hospital in Gothenburg and also at uh, Öranesa Hals in uh, Södra Älvsbörd sjukhus in, in Borås. Uh, and I asked him several times about the risks and he just told me, oh, yeah, there is only bleeding and risk for infection. And in, if we skip to the next side, we can see here are the complications. So it's just bleeding, uh, swelling around the eye, um, it could be pain or fever. If more than 30 degrees fever, you should contact the hospital. Uh, phone number is here. So, the, and here is, this is another one they, they tell about the bleeding, they tell about what, what kind of food you should have uh, after the surgery, and about what kind of activity you should have. Uh, and this is just the, the follow-up information in 7 to 10 days. So it's absolutely no information uh, about what kind of damage you will get from this surgery. That there is a risk of empty nose syndrome, a risk of your nose becoming extremely open, extremely dry, that you will get infection, that you can get holes uh, into your septum, septal perforation or holes into your sinus. Um, yeah, and this is the surgeon who did my surgery. So for you Swedish uh, viewers, um, yeah, this is the Dr. Anders Arnbrandt. He works at Salgrenska Universitet Sjukhus uh, and also at uh, Karlanderska Universitet Sjukhus. Kalandiska University, uh, eller Kalandiska um, Hospital. So uh, yeah, all surgeons are the same, so it won't matter if you have another one, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't choose this surgeon for sure. So let's go to the next uh, subject, uh, the deviated septum myth. So when you go to see a doctor, at least here in Sweden, uh, the first thing they will do uh, is to send you on an x-ray uh, to, to see how the nose looks like. And on that x-ray, in most cases, they will um, see and tell you that you have a deviated septum and they will use that as an argument to, for you to have septal surgery. Um, but it's not true. Uh, more or less everyone have a deviated septum. Uh, at least 80% of, of people have a more or less deviated septum. So it's normal. And let's look on, on these pictures. Um, here we have um, three patients. Uh, on the left side, we have one patient here with uh, absolutely straight septum. Uh, and you can see the, the turbinates here and the lower ones, the inferior ones, and the middle ones here. <clears throat> and the, the black area here is where it's open, where air can pass. So you can see that it's black here, air can pass, pass all the way around here. And if you go to the, to the other side, you, you have a patient here, his uh, septum is bent like this to the right. So there is a smaller uh, opening on the left side and a bigger opening on the right side. And what the surgeons never tell you about is that if you are 
um, born with a deviated septum, which mo most people are. Um, then the turbinates, they adopt the size and the shape after the, uh, how the nose is, is designed, how the, the space, how much space there is and everything. So it, it becomes uh, adopt, totally adopt. So you can still see here, even if the septum is bent to the right, there are a gap here on the right side uh, where air can pass. And even on the left side, there is gap here. So it doesn't matter if the septum is deviated. It's not the reason for, for nasal congestion. And we can also look at this patient. We have one turbinate a um, uh, little bit bigger on this side and a little bit smaller turbinate on this side. Uh, and the septum is bent on the, on the other side. So yeah, the body adopts the turbinates and the size and, and how, they, how they grow. And so it's, it's not the reason. The reason is allergy and food intolerances like I told before. But it, it's a very good thing to make people to go for this surgery because they can they can point out okay you have a sept deviated septum here you need to do this surgery uh, and like a patient if you don't know it's oh it's obvious I have a deviated septum of course it's the reason for my uh, uh, nasal congestion so yeah yeah I go for this surgery but it's just a way to trick the patients so don't believe in that. So uh, I'm going to let you listen to one doctor and what he say about uh, the deviated septum. It's going to be a, a few seconds video. This is Dr. Stephen Park from drstephenpark.com. Today we're going to talk about the deviated septum myth. A deviated septum is blamed for everything from a chronic stuffy nose and headaches to sinusitis and smell or taste problems. One of the most common statements that I hear from patients is that they were told that they had a deviated septum and that that was a cause for their breathing problems. I have to admit, every time I hear this, I roll my eyes internally since by definition, everyone has a deviated nasal septum. No one has a perfectly straight septum. So like you see here in, in this video, uh, it's not only me who claims that uh, a deviated septum is normal. Also the, this doctor, he, he say that yeah, most people have a deviated septum, at least more or less. So, yeah, this is just a, a reason doctors use to convince you to have a totally unnecessary surgery to your nose uh, to boost the revenue of their companies or to keep their business up and running. Uh, it's allergy and food intolerances uh, or general inflammation in your body that is the reason for, for this. The only time uh, where it's logical to have a surgery to your septum is if you had a damage to your nose in adult age. You fell on your nose and you damaged uh, the septum. Yeah, then it could be it could be a reason to have the surgery because the, the turbinates will not be able to adopt their size and their shape in that case. But in all other cases, most cases, that's not the reason. The, the reason is, like I say, allergy and inflammation, mold, uh, etc. So, yeah, don't trust doctors uh, in this case when they say that. So there is also uh, another thing doctors use to convince you to have uh, no surgery. Uh, if they can't find a deviated septum, they can convince you in another way. And from the x-ray, they can tell you that you have a, uh, I think in English it's called hypotrophic, uh, turbinate uh, it's an enlarged turbinate um, so they do one x-ray and like you see here they get one uh, one image in like a half a second or even less than that 
uh, and they say, okay, look here, Mr. Patient, you, you have a extremely large uh, inferior turbinate here and you have a large uh, middle turbinate here. Uh, this is the reason for your congestion. But the thing is that it's just one moment in time. And I told you a little bit before about the nasal cycle. You have a nasal cycle that goes from, from one side to the other side. This side swells up and the blood, blood vessels in the other nostril shrinks down. So if you take this image like one hour later, it could be the opposite side. So this side is, uh, is big and this side is small. But they won't tell you this, of course. They, they would use this as, an, as another reason for you to have uh, surgery to your, to your nose. So here we can see one example of this. We have a patient A on these two images and patient B on these two images. So um, x-ray was taken and you can see in this moment of time uh, the right side of the turbinate here in the right nostril was uh, swollen and big uh, and on the other side they were small and then they waited one hour or something I don't know the time but uh, then they could see okay now this side is small and this side is big so yeah another example of patient B this side is big, this side is small, and an hour later, yeah, it's opposite. This is small and this is big. So you see the, the doctors, they use this, and they say your turbinates are hypertrophic, they are too big, you need to reduce them in size. And it's just a lie, because you have a lot of blood vessels in them, and those blood vessels they dilate or shrink down the diameter of the, the blood vessel. And it shrinks or uh, contracts or grows the, the turbinates. So you can see how the septum is, if the septum is deviated or not, but you can't really look at the turbinates because they, they differ in size from one moment to another. So let's talk about the condition that I have gotten from my surgery and many other people also have gotten from the surgery. Um, and it's called empty nose syndrome. It's a fucking stupid name. I hate it. Uh, it doesn't say anything at all uh, what the condition is about. I think there was an American doctor and a Swedish doctor and uh, they they were the first two who started to talk about this condition and the Swedish doctor mentioned something like oh look like this nose and uh, this person have a lot of symptoms uh, this nose looks like an uh, uh, empty empty nose and they made uh, the name from that empty nose syndrome and the problem with the name empty nose syndrome is that it has nothing to do at all with uh, if you have the condition or not because the nose doesn't need to be empty for you to have this condition uh, you can have damage to to the mucosal lining to the thermoreceptors uh, and have this condition you can have your turbulence remaining uh, you can have an intact septum but you can still have this um, condition so uh, a better name would be iatrogenic nasal dysfunction and um, iatrogenic means um, a damage caused by um, healthcare providers by doctors uh, and yeah nasal dysfunction you understand uh, so yeah nasal dysfunction secondary to damage from from doctors so that's a, that's a good definition. Uh, and if, we, if we're talking about specifically um, the air hunger, the suffocation sensation, uh, and the stress on your breathing, and the, the lack of um, air perception, air feel in your nose, 
when we're talking about that, uh, we could name the condition TRPM8, mediated iatrogenic nasal dysfunction. And that's because those TRPM8 receptors are mainly what's involved in this condition. There are also other um, receptors involved, uh, like pressure receptors and, and things like that. But the main reason is those receptors. So these receptors are located um, pretty much all over the mucosa in, inside the nose, but they are more concentrated in, in your inferior turbinates, in your middle turbinates, and uh, at your septal swell body. Uh, that's an area, um, it's also called the fourth turbinate. And that's an area uh, on septum, a little bit above the inferior turbinate and in front of the middle turbinate. So these receptors are located on the surface of the mucosa. And those are the exact same receptors that you you can sense them when you blow on your hand like that. You get a cool sensation uh, and you also get that cool sensation inside your nose. And when those receptors become damaged, destroyed by uh, radio frequency or destroyed, actually removed, if, if the turbinates remove the turbinates, these receptors, yeah, they you lose them forever. Uh, it could also be secondary damage to these receptors because if you remove your turbinates, destroy your turbinates, your nose is going to be open, it's going to dry out. Uh, over time, that dryness can cause uh, destruction of uh, the mucosa membrane. Uh, you can get infections and that infection can also destroy those remaining receptors. Um, and when that happens, the brain won't receive this signal. Uh, this signal should be sent uh, via the fifth cranial nerve. Uh, and when that signal is not sent to the brain, um, there is a distress. Uh, and that's when you get um, suffocation sensation, air hunger, breathing problems. Uh, it feels more or less like the nose is uh, congested, but it's open. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about empty nose syndrome, um, different uh, complications and symptoms uh, of the condition. But right now I'm thinking uh, we are going to talk about how people experience the condition. So, so you who want to do this kind of surgery can get a view of how much suffer you can possibly get. So I'm not going to read up all of these comments. Uh, you can pause the video and read up them yourself. But I'm just going to read um, a few of them. Start with this one. Uh, does anyone else symptoms get so much worse at night? when trying to sleep. Uh, dry nose, throat despite uh, humidification, nasal mist, nasal gel, uh, suffocation feeling, I can't sleep, I can't get comfortable feel, feel like airway closes off. When I do fall asleep, I wake up in panic after 30 minutes. Any recommendations appreciated. Uh, this one, sleep uh, disturbance has got to be the worst symptom of ENS. Uh, everybody who has herbal sleep, please like or comment. For me, uh, I had four hours sleep in three days. I usually wake uh, right back up once I doze off, but if I manage to actually fall asleep, I usually only sleep 30 to 45 minutes and jolt up gasping for air. Uh, let's go to the other side. Um, I think you can read all this yourself here. Pause and read it. Um, you can just read the last one here. Not coping. Don't want to go on. 
uh, I don't know how to, to bear this and to get on with life. The lack of uh, nasal resistance and the impossibility of sleep, uh, uh, sleep breathing is unbearable. Um, three weeks ago I had a happy life and now it's just gone. Uh, I cannot see a solution for me and I'm not coping. Switch side again. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, you can read this yourself. I'm going to skip for another side. Another member of this group from France is dead. Uh, suicide. From what I know, he had a few surgeries, one by a young doctor who messed him up. Almost all his inferior turbulence were missing. He was struggling since uh, 2019. Uh, father of two children. Uh, I can't really answer questions because I don't know all the details. And I knew him just a bit. Uh, he's been discussed in the French group. Rest in peace. So yeah, it's, it's totally sick. Uh, another one, I have just received some tragic news that I thought should be shared with the group. We lost a member of our forum named, uh, oh, I, I removed the name here, to suicide a few days ago. He has been uh, struggling greatly with empty nose syndrome and all of the symptoms that come with it. He was a German sufferer who had a very severe case of ENS. Rest in peace, my friend. So yeah. During the three and a half year, I was in different forums on Facebook and internet. And there were like seven people or something like that who, who, who committed suicide from this condition. And that tells quite a bit how, how terrible this condition is. So, um, yeah, I'm going to show you two short videos uh, about two people who have this condition so you can see for yourself and, and listen what they have to say about their problems. When I had sinus surgery two years ago I never would have guessed that it would cause this degree of suffering. To make it worse I probably didn't need the surgery. The procedure that I had is called a turbinate reduction. Most people have no idea what the turbinates are, but they are extremely important to your breathing. Now, because of the surgery, mine don't work anymore, which means the air that I breathe into my lungs is very often cold and painful. And since you breathe 24 hours a day, it's pretty bad. It has destroyed my sleep, um, the nerves in my nose and in my sinuses don't pick up air as well as they used to. I barely feel air in my nose and my sinuses. And this pretty much gives your brain the signal that you're suffocating. And very often that's what it feels like is suffocating. So I dread going to bed for the first time in my life. I hate nighttime. Sleeping is a nightmare. I very often have woken up gasping for air. When I do sleep, it's usually from just total exhaustion. Uh, in the daytime, I'm physically and mentally exhausted from the poor sleep that I get every night. One of the main problems with turbinate reduction surgery is that most people have no idea what the turbinates are. If your tongue became swollen and the doctor wanted to cut part of it out, you'd have a serious problem with that because we all know that the tongue is important. But because we don't know that the turbinates are important, we don't really hesitate when the doctor talks about doing surgery on them. Um, when you think that the turbinates are just useless pieces of flesh that are blocking your airway, it kind of makes sense to surgically remove some of them. Another serious problem with turbinate reduction surgery is that your turbinates are not big in the same way that say your ears are big. If you have big ears, you just have big ears. Your turbinates are big because they're swollen and they're swollen because they're irritated by something. It could be your diet, it could be allergies, it could be something you're reacting to at, at your home or where you work. 
So those things can be eliminated, and it just makes more sense to attack the problem that way than to risk ending up with a condition as horrible as mine through surgery. Hello, Dr. Song. Hello, Jay. Hello, GNG. Here I'm in Germany in, uh, in a hospital. They will try to make me better, but it's still not, maybe not possible. I don't know. It's a uh, flip a coin. And yeah, I suffered. I suffered day by day because your surgery, Dr. Song. You make two holes in my nose and now they, you can put a train inside or a truck and uh, I cannot sleep. I feel en energyless and hopeless and I ask myself all the time why I come to Korea to GNG. Have a nice day. So like you see, it's a lot of uh, suffering uh, in this condition. So if you want to read more, uh, this is a good article. Uh, Empty Nose Syndrome, a guide to diagnosis and management for medical professionals. In this one, you can read more about Empty Nose Syndrome. Uh, there is a link up here, but of course you can't click on the link in, uh, in the YouTube video. Uh, but I'm going to add this link on um, my OneDrive account and um, I'm going to share that um, I'm going to share the whole PowerPoint presentation on OneDrive. So under this uh, video here in YouTube, I'm going to put the link so you can find this PowerPoint presentation and you can read everything here and you can also click on the links in that PowerPoint presentation. So now I'm going to talk a little bit further about uh, ENS, uh, why it happens, uh, how it works, what complications there is, and uh, yeah. So on this page, I'm not going to read up everything here because I've been talking about that, that pretty much before. Um, so you can just um, pause and read that yourself. Um, so there's a few reasons for, for empty nose syndrome. Um, and the main reason from my view is the, the lack of the thermoreceptors, the damage of those receptors. Uh, it could be straight away from the surgery um, or it could be secondary from dryness and infections. Um, but there is also another uh, reason, not, not as big I think, but um, when you remove the turbinates, the, the volume inside the nose increases a lot. And the thing is that these receptors, uh, the thermoreceptors, okay, you lose them in the turbinates, but uh, in one way you still have some receptors remaining in the septal mucosa, in the nasal floor, in the middle turbinates, and so on. Um, but those receptors will be less activated when the nose become open. One reason for that is the, um, I think it's called Venturi, Venturi effect in English as well. Um, and it works like this. When you inhale uh, through your nose, uh, there is first op openness in the in the first part of the nose and when the air reaches the turbinates the volume uh, the open volume in the nose decreases a lot uh, and the air kind of compresses so you you have a, a velocity increase in the airstream so the speed of the airstream increases quite a lot uh, when it passes the turbinates and that velocity increase helps to activate those thermoreceptors. So when you remove the um, turbinates, 
there will be no such compression of the air uh, and the remaining receptors in the nose will be less activated so that that that's that's one reason and you can feel that yourself if you have a healthy nose and you inhale you can inhale inhale slowly you feel it's not that cold but you, if you inhale strongly you can feel it's you have a stronger sensation of coolness in your nose and that's exactly what i'm talking about when you have those turbulence there the air passes it compresses the velocity increases and those remaining receptors is activated uh, way more so yeah so i have one example for you here this is a cfd study i think it's called it's an airflow measurement study um, and on the left side here we have uh, pre-surgery mesh measurements and on the right side we have um, post-surgery measurements and the color here shows the velocity of the airstream this is somehow calculated by a computer so uh, blue color uh, means low airspeed or zero airspeed and then green uh, becomes a little bit higher uh, yellow orange and red and red is the highest velocity so you can see here before surgery uh, you can see it's quite narrow here this means that you have a lot of higher air velocity uh, here and if you look on the on the right side after surgery you can see here that this for example this area here is this this area on the on that pic that picture it's blue. This means that there is no airspeed here, or at least very, very, very little airspeed. If you compare that before the surgery, here is green. So here you have kind of two, two meter per second or something. Uh, so this is the the exact thing I'm talking about. When you decrease the size of the turbinates. Uh, even if you still have some some receptors remaining in this turbinate there might be damage from radio frequency but if there are still functional receptors here uh, those will be activated less because it's it's open now and the velocity of the airstream is is lower and you can clearly see this on the on all of the image you, you can pause here and look for yourself um, but it's th that's one reason it's not the biggest reason i think is the biggest reason is still the, the damage to the thermoreceptors but yeah it's one reason and here is um, uh, another reason as well for ens and when you remove the turbinates or if you do um, heavily performed radio frequency for example so the the turbinates shrink down extremely much the airstream will change inside the nose uh, the body is designed for having you inhale and once the um, once the air hits the front part of the turbinates it's divided so you get a little bit air between your lower turbinate and your nasal floor you get a little bit air between uh, uh, the, um, the lower inferior turbinate and the middle one and you get a little bit of air stream coming up in the nose like this so if you remove the, the turbinates this air stream will be affected and this can also be be a reason for lack of air feel inside the nose uh, this could also affect uh, the ability to sense smell to to feel how things smell 
because you get less of these particles far up in the nose and also there should be for have optimal um, sense of smell you should have one nostril a little bit more open and one nostril a little bit more closed for having a different kind of circulation of those part particles in each nostril so what you see on these pictures here is a, a healthy person who ha haven't had any surgery to the turbinates or septum and you can see here the there's one airstream on the surface on the nasal floor here there's one airstream between the inferior turbinate and the middle turbinate and there are airstream going up uh, far up in the nose if we look at the b the middle image here uh, we can see that the the air is uh, airstream is uh, moving along the nasal floor uh, and not so much uh, on this area i think it's called the middle meatus or meatus it's between uh, the middle turbinate and the inferior turbinate uh, and a lot of air is coming up in the upper part of the nose and this this person here he had um, surgery to his middle turbinate so he has some volume loss up here so you can clearly see that a lot of air comes up this way so it works a little bit like like water water always takes the easiest way so if there is less air resistance here the airstream will take this way this means that there will be not so much airflow in this direction and if there are any remaining functional receptors here they will not be activated like they should so uh, if we go to C, C is a person who had surgery to his lower inferior turbinates down here. I think he, according to how the image looks, he probably have a, a bit of inferior turbinates remaining here in the back. But you can see that uh, air comes inside the nose and you get turbulence here when it hits the, the new head of the turbinate, which is probably the the middle part in in uh, before surgery and uh, so now the air moves mainly above the inferior turbinate in the middle meatus so yeah you get some kind of yeah it doesn't spread like it should the upper part of the nose here gets way less uh, of the airstream so it can affect um, the sense of smell it can affect how much this area is uh, uh, these receptors these thermal receptors how much they are activated so it's those three reasons um, from what i understand of empty nose syndrome first those receptors are removed by the surgeon when he removed the turbinates or they are destroyed during radio frequency uh, secondary, they are destroyed by dryness years after the uh, in operation, or they are destroyed um, by infection. That happened to me uh, also. I got one infection four years after my surgery, and the few remaining receptors got damaged, uh, and I got empty nose syndrome completely first. Four years after the surgery i had problems before and um, dryness and um, sleep problems but not really so much air hunger sensation that came came after the infection so it's that reason and it's the, the another reason i talked about before where the the air velocity decreases and those receptors are activated less and it's the third reason here where the airflow doesn't spread like it used to be, used to do in the nose so it could be some areas inside the nose that's not activated by the airstream like they should should do in a healthy nose without surgery so i'm now going to switch and talk a little bit about the different methods for uh, surgery of the turbin turbinates uh, so the first method I'm going to talk about is uh, radio frequency 
Uh, and that's a method where you insert a small uh, instrument shaped like a stick into the turbinate and you heat it up. Uh, so you actually cook the turbines from inside um, and that destroys all the blood vessels within. So it makes a turbinate to shrink down and that's why they do it because they want to allow more air to pass the nostril. Um, but the problem with this method is that you don't know how careful the surgeon is. Is he going to uh, do one location and burn? Is he going to do two, three, four, five, six locations? So the more time he do it, the bigger damage you will get. Uh, and also some surgeons, they recommend the patients to come back like in, in a year and do it again. So eventually these people will, will get um, dramatically damage of the turbinate. So, and it's also another problem, even if the surgeon is um, careful and only do it at one, two, three locations, uh, he can put it too close to the surface of the turbinate. And if he burns, when it's too close to the surface, who will also um, destroy the outer part of the turbinate. And that's where you have all the function. You have the, the cilla, the small hair, and you have the um, goblet cell that produce all the mucus in the nose, and you have all those kind of nerve endings, the receptors that sense different stimuli in the nose, uh, for example, the thermal receptors that sense the airflow. Uh, it's those receptors where you can sense the cool sensation when you inhale. Uh, so if the surgeon burns too close to the surface of the turbinate, he will destroy the outer part of the turbinate and then you become numb. Uh, you will become extremely dry uh, and numb. And uh, since he also destroys the blood vessels, um, the nose will not be able to regulate the airflow anymore, so it will always be open. And that's not good for the breathing, not good for the um, uh, relaxing state, and it's not good for the mucosa, because uh, the mucosa, the, the nose will always be open. So there will be, um, in the long term, secondary damage to the mucosa from dryness, maybe from in infection. So the second method, uh, uh, it's called coblation, coblation or electrocautery. I'm, I'm not sure about the words in English, but it's a similar method to radio frequency. It's more or less ex the exact same, but um, you use higher heat uh, uh, with this one. So you have even further destruction of the nose. So. Uh, I wouldn't recommend any of these methods or I wouldn't recommend any surgery at all. Um, but definitely not coblation. It's better to do radio frequency. Another method is uh, when you use something which is called a micro debreeder. Um, it's more or less like a, like a stick. And on the top of it or in the um, inside it you have some knives and when you insert it into the turbinate it actually tears and yeah destroys the turbinate from from within so uh, in one way this method is better uh, because there is no heat so you can't really damage the the outer part of the um, mucosa but like you see on the image here, uh, if there is one surgeon who are careful, he will just insert it straight like this. Only one time straight into the turbinate and back out and he's done. But uh, if the surgeon do like this, he insert it and he start to move it around, uh, he will destroy all of the tissue inside here and the turbinate will not be able to swell up. It will just be some, you will just only have the, the skin part, mucosa part, uh, and uh, 
blood vessels and everything within the turbinate will be totally destroyed. So the nose is going to be extremely open. So another method is uh, laterization of the inferior turbinates. Uh, and this method can cause damage of course as well, but it's considered to be the safest one. So you actually insert like an instrument and you break the bone within the turbinate and you re-angle it. So you, you break the bone and you move it towards the um, lateral wall, towards your sinus wall. So you move it from, from, from this side to that side in the right nostril. And if you do it in the left nostril, you do it on the opposite. So from this side to that side. Uh, so it allows more air to pass uh, between the turbinate here and the septum. Uh, and uh, if it's not good, I think you can, it's not a good solution, but you can probably move it back. Uh, it will not be perfect like it was before, uh, but it's in most cases is, is probably, um, it, it can be done probably in most cases. Uh, and uh, the bad part with this solution is that when you move it inwards like this, uh, all this area here will be um, will not receive any airflow. So this part is is more or less like it become numb. So, but yeah, you still have some some thermoreceptors and everything here. So I think it should be fine. But you have to understand that you will get less um, sensation, less perception of airflow uh, in the nose but i i think this method is the if you're going to do any surgery at all to your nose this method is probably the the best and the safest one so the the worst part i guess that can happen is uh, if there is um, some nerves inside here that will tear uh, when he he re-angles it um, I guess the turbinate can become numb and I heard some people who who had this. Um, I don't know how common it is, but it's one thing to yeah to think about before having this kind of surgery. So the next uh, method is um, uh, partial removal of the turbinate or yeah you can remove the, the whole part with like uh, um, scalpel or with the scissor um, so it depends on what the surgeon thinks it's best for you so there is no um, right or wrong way to do it according to the surgeons they if he thinks it's it's best he can remove the entire inferior turbinate or he can remove the first like two centimeters or the first four centimeters. Um, so yeah, this is the method I had. So like you see, these are, are my pictures before the surgery. Here, the turbinates are all the way to the front here and all the way back. Um, but after the surgery, you can see here that uh, it's like the free hanging part of the turbinate in the front here is totally gone. So it's just, uh, it's just um, um, the back part here, um, the posterior part. So uh, I would say in, in my case, it's, it's not more than like maximum two centimeters left of the turbinate. Um, so this is the absolute worst kind of surgery you can do. Uh, it will destroy you and uh, it will make you numb for air air perception air sensation you won't feel any um, air coming into your nose uh, or at least it will heavily reduce that uh, sensation and there's also another problem with this method uh, i'm going to show you uh, a little bit later here but um, you know the part that is left here 
it's not going to be untouched. Uh, it's going to be um, it's going to have a lot of scars from the from the surgery because he removed this part and he then tries to take the mucosa that's left over to like fold it uh, and um, try to attach it to the to the flesh wound so um, yeah the remaining stump of the turbinet will will not become functional you will have a lot of scars and on those scars uh, there will be no functional mucosa uh, so there will be no um, functional Scylla, the, the tiny hairs, there will be no functional goblet cells, no functional receptors. So it's just a extremely stupid way of doing surgery to the nose. Um, don't do it, it will definitely, without any doubt, destroy you for the rest of your life. So this is how it looks uh, after. Um, so if you have a totally uh, removal of your inferior turbinate, this is how it's going to look. Uh, so if you look on the bottom picture here, it's an x-ray. So the turbinates, they should be all over this area coming down here. But they are now removed totally, so it's just a black open hole here. And this is how it looks inside the nose. So this is the upper part of the turbinate. Is the only part remaining now. All this part here below is removed. So the airstream here would be extremely destroyed. The air pressure would be destroyed. There is going to be less velocity of the air. It's going to activate the thermal receptors less. Um, the airstream will pass only here. Uh, not so much up to the upper part of the nose. It will also reduce the... Um, um, perception of airflow. So in the middle picture here you can see how, how it was before the surgery um, and here it's how it looks after. Uh, middle picture you can also see how, how open the nose is. Um, and here you can also see a hole in the septum so this person probably had a um, surgery to his um, septum as well. So let's talk a little bit about uh, um, appearance change um, from septoplasty and from turbinate surgery. So uh, this is my, my uh, images. Uh, this is how my nose was before the surgery. Uh, symmetrical, uh, more or less perfectly symmetrical. Uh, and after the surgery, my nose become really thin, uh, especially on the middle here, the middle part, uh, and it become uneven, have some some bumps and some kind of holes. Um, and of course, the doctors won't tell you this. So I think it's it's mainly it's ninety percent because the. Um, surgery to the septum but it's a little bit I think it's affected by the removal of the front part of the turbinates because it's I have seen in other cases it can make the, this part of the nose a little bit less wide uh, but in my case I would say 95 percent of the appearance change is uh, related to the surgery of my septum so I'm now going to talk about septoplasty and the risk and the complications that the doctor won't mention to you. Uh, besides uh, change of the appearance of the nose, there's also risk of perforation of the nasal septum. Uh, if the surgeon removes too much cartilage, uh, there will be a hole between the two nostrils. And that hole cannot be easily fixed afterwards. Especially if it's a big one, uh, you can't really do much about it. Uh, some people, they try with uh, septal plugs made of some kind of rubber or plastic. Uh, and um, yeah, it's not a good solution. Also, um, to be able to have surgery on the septum, uh, you need to remove the mucosa from the cartilage uh, structure. Uh, so when that happens, uh, the mucosa will become damaged 
and blood vessels will rip and uh, nerves will rip uh, and the mucosa will become numb. I'm going to show you um, a YouTube video uh, after this um, slideshow here uh, that explains how the mucosa will be damaged. And also there is a risk of uh, destruction of the septal swell body. That's an area uh, quite far back in the nose, just a little bit above the inferior turbinate and in front of the middle turbinate. Uh, it's also called the, the fourth turbinate and it has a similar function to the, uh, to the other turbinates. It can uh, secrete mucus, it has a lot of uh, receptor cells like therm thermal receptors, um, it has a lot of um, goblet cells that produce uh, mucus. So let's uh, start to look at this uh, YouTube video and I'm going to explain what will happen to the mucosa during septal surgery. So what you see on this image uh, is the septum to the right side and uh, the surgeon is now going to make a cut here and uh, to be able to insert the instrument and remove the mucosa from the wall. So I'm going to play the video and you will see how, how, he, how he does this. So now he makes the incision and he he changed tool for another uh, I think it's called an elevator and he uses quite a lot of force to remove the mucosa from the wall here and this is the problem when when this happens uh, if the surgeon is not careful he will rupture the mucosa uh, and cause a lot of uh, tears in the, in the mucosa. A common reason to why people have surgery to septum is uh, if they have a septal spur. A septal spur is a ridge between these three plates. If you look at the image in the lower left corner, you can see there's three plates here. And uh, if you get a septal spur, it's like a ridge between those those uh, three plates. Um, so to be able to remove that ridge, uh, the surgeon needs to remove the mucosa from the wall. Uh, and you can see on this image, this is where the septal swell body is located. So it's really close to the septal spur and you cannot only remove the mucosa from the wall, just here you need to remove some extra uh, parts of the wall to be able to see and um, operate. So on the upper left side here you can see the septal swell body, the white area. It's an MRI uh, image. And on image to the uh, right side here and uh, you can see my septal spur. This is before my surgery. Um, so you can see how it's located really close to the septal swell body up here. And this image shows how thick my septum was before the surgery. Uh, I had a lot of functional blood vessels uh, in it and after the um, surgery you can see how thin it has become. Um, this is another image showing how close the septal swell body is to the, um, the septal spur here. And on this image you can see that uh, um, structure of the nose has become damaged. It should be shaped like this here, but it's now um, yeah, concave here and it's a trench. You can see it's a trench here uh, and the mucosa is th super thin. You can even see some old parts of cartilage all, almost coming out uh, from the wall here or almost making a perforation because it's so thin. So uh, the septal swell should be up here and in this case you should not be able to see the uh, middle turbinate because the septal body should be in the way for it. So these are some other images from my nose and I'm now going to show you how <coughs> a septoplasty will destroy the function of the septal mucosa. Uh, so on the left side here you can see two images from my left nostril, uh, the nostril where I didn't have any surgery to the septum. 
I only had surgery to the turbinates here. And on the right side, you can see my uh, right nostril where I had both surgery to my turbinates and to my uh, septum. So um, on the, if we look on the pair of images on the left side here, uh, on the right of those images, you can see how my nose looks inside when I had um, some decongestion spray. So you can see it's opened up. And on the left side here, you can see septum, how it's shaped like that. And on the other side, there's the remaining part of the turb inferior turbinate, and this is the middle turbinate. So on, on the other side, I did one experiment here, and I was standing on my head uh, to make the blood vessels to fill up uh, and make the nose as con congested as possible. Um, so I stood at my head and I uh, stand it up and immediately a few seconds later I took some images and you can clearly see that um, there is a big difference between those two images and I've been taking these um, shots like um, at the same location so pretty much uh, the same centimeters uh, in, into the nose so in the left here, you can't really see much inside the nose. It's so congested. So that means the, 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 the blood vessels and everything uh, within the septum, septal mucosa still works. And you can also see that the blood vessels on the lateral wall and in the remaining parts of the turbinates, uh, they still function. Uh, and here you can see it's open. So yeah, it's a big difference between those two images. But if we instead uh, go to the to the right side here, where I had the septoplasty, uh, you can see it's a uh, it's not really a big difference between those two images. And I also have to say that you can see some lines here. It's because uh, I I took some individual individual photos and I'm try to make one panoramic uh, photo of them together <clears throat> and it was hard to yeah to make it proper in, in this case but uh, yeah on the left side here you can see when I used um, um, decongestion spray so here it's as open as it can be and you can see how extremely open the nostril is and on the other side uh, you can see it's uh, after I've been standing on my head. So the middle turbinate could possibly swell up a little bit more. It's not uh, totally uh, at its biggest size, but it's pretty much um, filled with blood. And um, so you can see there's not really much difference between those two images. If you, if you compare the left nostril here, you can see there's a big difference uh, it's narrow here, you can't really see into the nose, and in this one you can see a lot of um, a lot of space in the nose. So yeah, this tells you one thing, that all this area, the septum is doesn't work anymore. It's passive, it's super thin, it's like a millimeter, less than a millimeter, it's probably like, like a third of a millimeter. And yeah, it just can't um, swell anymore and it can't regulate the air to the upper part of the nose. And when it becomes thin like this, it also becomes dry. Um, and you can, like I said, you can get infections from it. Uh, and also another part is that you, and in, in my case, I lost uh, the sen sensory function. I, I can't uh, feel the airflow in this nostril at all. So I have some more proof here for you how a septoplasty can destroy the blood vessels within the septal mucosa and how it can destroy the septal swell body. And there is a pair of images to the left hand side and there is a pair of images to the right hand side. So on the right hand side there is my right nostril where I had the septoplasty performed and on the left side there is my left nostril where I had only surgery to the turbinates, the inferior turbinates performed. So the other images you saw on the previous page, 
they showed some panoramic views of uh, my nostril. In, in this slideshow, I'm showing just a local um, picture in front of the um, septal swell body. So uh, if you see on the left side here, um, the left image is when I had been using decongestion spray. So you can see it's open and you can see the shape of the septum here. This is the lateral wall, this is septum, and this is the location of the septal swell body. And this is the middle turbinate. So when I have been using decongestion spray, you can see how this area has been opened, opened up. So uh, I, after that, I did another experiment and I was standing on my head like the previous one. And then the blood vessels will become dilated and the nose will become as congested as it can be. Uh, so you can see like now it's not possible really to, to see. You can see the middle turbinate. The middle turbinate is behind here. And you can clearly see how the septal swell body has been increasing in size here. So this tells you one thing for sure. It tells you that the septal swell body works. Yeah. And if you go to the other side, and the side where I had the septoplasty. So on the left image here, you can see the septum on the right side here. This is the lateral wall, the, the wall where the inferior turbulence is and the wall next to the sinuses, the maxillary sinus. And this is uh, when I have been using decongestion spray. So now you can see it's open, the middle turbinate is uh, it's quite small. You see there, there are some area here it can fill up. Um, and if we go to the right image, you can clearly see now the middle turbine here is extremely big. It has like filled up the whole area here. So it can't become any bigger than this. It's just impossible. So this tells you that um, I have congestion in the nose as much as possible. But the thing is, you can still see the middle turbinate. You should not be able to see the middle turbinate here. That's the problem. So this tells you that the septum, the septal mucosa here, the blood vessels, the bigger blood vessels within the septal mucosa is damaged. And it also tells you that the septal swell body area up here is damaged because it should swell up in a shape like this. So you should not be able to see the, the middle turbinate exactly like this. Here you can see it, here you cannot see it. So it should be exactly like that. And this shows how a septoplasty will destroy the function of the septal mucosa. So that's a proof uh, for sure. And the surgeons, uh, they probably know about this, but they won't tell you. They won't tell you and like I told you before uh, when the mucosa becomes thin like this it will become dry uh, and when the surgeon tears the mucosa he also tears the nerves and the blood vessels and it will become numb and uh, like I said it will become dry and from the dryness you can get the infection and that infection will damage the mucosa even more and damage the remaining functional thermoreceptors even more. So yeah, in my right nostril where I had the septoplastic perform, I had absolutely no air feel. I can't feel the airflow in that nostril at all. And when the good left nostril has closed off, uh, I, I just can't feel the, the airflow at all in, in my bad right nostril. And that's when I have the air hunger, the suffocation sensation, the distress, uh, the sleeping problems. This is when I wake up 
all the time at night, breathing through my bad right nostril where I can't feel the airflow at all. So now you know what can happen if you do a surgery to your septum. So let's talk a little bit uh, about how common uh, complications is from uh, surgery to your turbinates. So uh, this is a study made by Steven Hauser. He actually looks on several studies and compare those and yeah, compare what kind of uh, surgery that was performed and what kind of complications the patients have within two to seven years after the surgery. So um, like it is now, Worldwide, there is no specific method of turbinate surgery um, that is recommended. And surgeons can do whatever they want to do. So if you're unlucky and you get a surgeon uh, who likes to remove the entire turbinates, yeah, you're going to get really bad outcome. You're going to get empty nose syndrome. And if you find another surgeon who just like do radio frequency, uh, you might not get empty nose syndrome. You might get other problems, but you never know. You can also get that from from septoplast uh, from uh, radio frequency. So in this specific study here, I'm going to uh, look at when people had their entire turbinates removed. So when people have their entire, I don't, I'm not sure if it's only inferior turbulence or if it's, it's inf only inferior turbulence, yeah. Uh, so people who had their inferior turbulence totally removed, those people had within two to seven years, a lot of problems. And 89%, nine of 10 people had chronic dryness. 66%, seven out of 10 people had atropic rhinitis, um, some kind of degeneration of the mucosal membrane. 22% had uh, Ocena, uh, I'm not sure about spelling, but that's, uh, that's an infection where the nose produces green mucus that smells really bad. Also 11% had problems with dry eyes. So if we go to the next side, uh, we can see all the um, different studies uh, Stephen has um, been looking at. So if you look at submucal resection on the right side here, uh, submucos, submucosal resection is a method where you don't destroy the outer part of the turbinates, uh, the part where the seal lies, where the goblet cells is. Um, where the thermal receptors is. So you still leave that part of the um, turbinates intact and you only remove the central part, the blood vessels within uh, and makes the, um, reduces the volume of the turbinate. Uh, so the, if this performed in a good way, at least in theory, uh, it should not affect the function that much of the turbinate. So you can see that only 10% had crusting, only 2.8% had synthetia. Synthetia, it's a thing where, for example, um, left side of the nose can grow together with the right side or um, inferior turbinates can grow together with the uh, nasal floor. Uh, only 2.8% had that, and only 2.8% had poor MCCT plus uh, IgA. I'm not sure what that poor MCCT is, but I think it's uh, lack of IgA, so it's a lack of uh, antibacterial function in the nose. So only 2.8% had that, and there were no people who had atrophy, uh, degeneration of the mucosal membrane. So based on this study, uh, I can only say that um, the method is important. So if you're going to have surgery, choose your surgeon and your method really carefully. Now I'm just quick going to talk about uh, other problems you can have from uh, nose surgery. Um, so this is the thing I was talking about before, uh, nasal adhesion or 
I don't know how this spells nasal synthetia. Uh, it's the thing where some parts of the nose can grow together. So in this case, you could see that there are some connection between the tissue of the middle turbinate and the lateral wall and between the middle turbinate and the septum. So this happens if the surgeon doesn't put protection properly inside the nose after the surgery. Um, and on this side you can see uh, adhesion between the uh, remnants of the inferior turbinate and the septal wall. Uh, also, another thing that will happen if you have uh, your turbinates partly removed by scissor or by um, scalpel, uh, you will have some scar tissue to the remaining stump of the turbinate. So in this, uh, these images here you can see, it's actually my images uh, in my nose, so you can see there are some white parts here. There are uh, scar tissue uh, here and here. And that scar tissue is non-functional um, tissue. It's, uh, it looks more, more or less like the, the skin under the foot. It uh, doesn't have any any like functional thermoreceptors or goblet cells or, or scylla so so even if this stump is like left over if the surgeon didn't remove this that it, this doesn't mean that this part of the turbinate will function this will still be become destroyed uh, and you will not be able to sense the the airflow uh, or your airflow sensation will be heavily re reduced. So this is what I was talking about before. <clears throat> Septal perforation. This is something you can get from uh, septoplasty. Uh, if the surgeon removes too much of the cartilage, uh, you will get a big hole here. And if it's this big, it's nothing to do really. You can't fix this afterwards. Uh, so you, you will have a open hole between your two nostrils, between a left and a right nostril. Here are some other images that shows the hole between uh, my left nostril and my left um, uh, maxillary sinus. So you can even see them on the x-ray here and here and here. So in my case uh, the hole is probably a centimeter so I was lucky but yeah, it could be the entire wall that collapses and becomes destroyed. So another thing uh, you can get is uh, degeneration of the mucosal membrane. These are my images and uh, these are my images uh, four years after my surgery. Um, I had um, some kind of bacterial infection. Um, maybe by Staphylococcus or MRSA, I think it's called. Um, so when the surgeon removes big parts of the turbinates or the whole parts of the turbinates or when the septal mucosa is destroyed by septoplasty, the nose will become dry. Uh, it will lose the ability to defend itself from bacteria and virus. So, um, yeah, and you can see the images here. They are some parts of the mucosa is white. Actually, most part of the mucosa is white. And it should be red like this here and here. So this means that there is some kind of infection or degeneration ongoing. Um, so this is something you will get in time if you remove the turbinates or if you destroy the septal mucosa. Uh, this is the back part of the nose. It's also some scarring and some white tissue here. It's because there are cold um, air in a constant flow 
coming back and hitting the wall back there and it dries it out and causes a lot of pain and um, yeah causes scar tissue to form these are also some images showing degeneration or maybe inflammation of the mucosal membrane this is the in the upper part of my nostril uh, beside the um, upper part of the middle turbinate you can see the white part here shows that there are some kind of degeneration ongoing or inflammation so yeah this is something you can count on if you do this kind of surgery long term at least this is another part uh, the upper part of my right nostril where i have this degeneration and inflammation as well and if i touch this area um, uh, I will have um, like a nerve pain inside my right eye as well. So I know many people have um, nerve pain shooting out in the eye or in the face and it's not uncommon after this kind of uh, surgeries. I showed you this image um, just before but if you remove the turbinates, these parts you see within the green circle here and the um, airflow will not spread evenly throughout the nostril it will you will have a jet stream of air flowing along your nasal floor and it will hit the back part of your nose and it will dry it out and it will cause inflammation it will cause uh, scar tissue and this white part here you can see in my nose is scar tissue so this is the the bottom part of my inferior turbinate and this is the nasal floor and now uh, air moves just along the nasal floor and it, it hits it hits the the back part here the nasopharynx and it's painful it causes dry throat and it causes um, scar tissue on on the back part here so that was a little bit about um, complications that you can have if you choose to go forward with um, septoplasty or turbinate reduction. Uh, of course there are other things that can happen but um, there are some of the consequences. So I was now supposed to talk a little bit uh, about uh, why these kind of surgeries is performed when we have a lot of scientific research and we have a lot of patient stories who, who claim they are worse after these kind of surgeries uh, but i've been talking quite a lot now and this youtube video is starting to be long so i'm going to skip that if you are a swedish viewer you can just read this uh, page uh, yourself here but basically it's about money um, and um, they don't care at all it's a it's an old system and um, they don't want to evaluate again this they started this kind of surgeries like 30 30 40 50 years ago and they don't want to re reevaluate um, and they don't want to listen to the patients so yeah uh, and the thing is these kind of surgeries is going to still be performed more people are going to be damaged so yeah the only we can do the only i can do is try to inform you what the consequences will be will be um, yeah so I'm now going to talk um, a little bit about um, why we have these symptoms of suffocation and air hunger um, because most doctors, they, or maybe not most, but some doctors, they don't want to believe in uh, empty nose syndrome and um, suffocation, the air hunger problem. Um, I think this is because it's a threat against their jobs against their companies um, so they don't want to listen to the patients and they you say it's just up in our heads we can't explain this we don't know but the, the truth is I've been looking at uh, quite a few scientific studies now and there are explanations for the air hunger uh, and it's not complicated really it's just that these surgeons the system they don't want to admit this they don't want to search for an explanation because that explanation would say don't do turbinate surgery um, so if we start here first uh, with a study and uh, this is a study 
where they had two groups, one group with empty nose syndrome patients and one group with um, uh, healthy, normal people. So they wanted to see if uh, there could be a different brain activation in patients with empty nose syndrome. So they allowed these two control groups to, to smell uh, menthol. This is a um, substance that activates the thermoreceptors inside the nose, similar to just cold air. Uh, so they made the two groups smell on that and they made also those two groups to smell nothing. And when they did those two um, things, they looked at MRI and um, they were looking at how brain signals were, uh, how the brain was activated. And they could see different uh, cerebral activation in the brain. Uh, and they could see that when, when people were, both groups were smelling nothing, they could see that uh, the empty nose syndrome group they had no activation or they had a different kind of activation in this um, different kind of cerebral activation in the brain. So this is an image I found from the study. Unfortunately, I, I didn't want to pay for the whole study. So there is no explanations really um, because it, I, I had to pay money for that. Um, but this is what they were looking at how the brain was activated and they could see on emptiness syndrome people uh, when when these were sm s smelling nothing, um, yeah, th there was a difference between the the normal healthy group and the empty nose syndrome group, and when they allowed the empty nose syndrome group to smell on menthol, so these remaining thermoreceptors in the nose were activated. They could see uh, a similar activation in the brain of the empty nose syndrome people, like the other healthy group had. So this is important and it shows really that it's related with these thermoreceptors and other receptors. If you activate these receptors, you will get some activation in the head. And um, they also made a conclusion, if this signal is not sent to the brain, there will be an activation of the limbic system. And the limbic system is a system um, correlated with uh, stress response, uh, sleeping problems and yeah, stuff like that. So from that study, we know that the limbic system in the brain is activated uh, if these signals from the nose, uh, the signals from the thermoreceptors if that signal is not sent to the brain, we know from the study that the limbic system in the brain is activated. And um, you can read this yourself. Uh, I translated this into English. Um, so if you look at the brain here, these are the different areas that are, are, are affected um, or that are cor correlated with the, the limbic system. And these are other areas you can see. Um, this is kind of same areas, but um, in different uh, separate images. Uh, so you, yeah, you can just take a look. It's pretty a lot of things in the brain that is affected. Um, so for example, uh, I'm not going to read up all this because I don't know how to pronounce it in English really. But I'm just going to read up what will be affected when the limbic system is activated. So um, this part here, amygdala is involved in fear and aggression. Um, hippocampus, it's um, related to how you navigate uh, when you are like outside walking. Uh, so how you can remember where you are and where you should go and yeah, to navigate. Uh, it's also related to the short term memory. Uh, hypothalamus, um, it manages uh, the release of hormones and it also regulates the, um, the heart, the heartbeats and yeah. uh, the orbifrontal cortex, it's involved in uh, uh, cognitive processes of decision making. Um, 
and mammillary bodies is, is important for the episodic memory. I think that episodic memory is the short term memory. Uh, and last one here, stria terminalis. Uh, plays an important role in controlling autonomic um, and this word I don't neuro neuro neurodocrine and behavioral responses. So, like you see here, when the limbic system is activated, like it is when you have empty nose syndrome, when these signals is not sent to the brain, and uh, there will be a lot of consequences to your nervous system, to your brain, and it will affect the. Uh, your entire body. This is another image I found when I did research about the, the breathing uh, and the, the nose. So um, from studies they can find that um, if they look at healthy individuals who had no surgery to the nose they can see that the nasal breathing it uh, regulates the autonomic nervous system the activation of that one and the brain activity. And that happens through mechanical stimulation of the neurons in the nasal captivity. Uh, and that's exactly what I've been talking about the whole time now here. Uh, it's the nerve endings and the thermal receptors and all other receptors that are affected. Uh, they can also see that um, nasal breathing increases alpha waves in the brain. And alpha waves are those brain uh, waves you can see when you look at people who are relaxed. Uh, can also, they can also see um, that the nose breathing stimulate the vagus, uh, vagus nerve, I think it's called. Um, it actually increases uh, HRV through, uh, throughout parasympathetic activity. So uh, HRV, it's a um, method where they measure time difference between each heart, heartbeat. And when you are stressed, um, you, you have uh, HRV that are low. And when you feel good, happy, calm, relaxed, you have one HRV um, that are high. So in my case, for example, I have a watch, uh, just a simple watch like that, that um, registrates my, my sleep and my stress levels and everything. And I wake up like every two, three hours. Uh, and when I do that, I have problems with my breathing. I have, um, like I told you before, the um, suffocation, the air hunger, and I can't, can't feel my can't feel the airflow in my right nostril and uh, so each time when this happens i can see on my watch that my hrv is uh, low which means i'm in stress um, stress activation of my um, uh, nervous system this is another study i found when i did my research and uh, it's not about empty nose syndrome, but anyway, we can make some really important conclusions. In this study, they were looking at a group with um, sick people who had epilepsy, and they were comparing that group with uh, just a normal he healthy group. So one thing they were looking at was how the brain activity of those people with epilepsy was affected. Um, from how you were breathing, if you were breathing through your nose or if you were breathing through your mouth. Uh, so I'm not going to read all of it. It's translated already into English with a Google Translate. And so yeah, the conclusions they made is that breathing through your nose synchronizes electrical activity in the piriform cortex as well as in the limbic um, system related areas. And these are areas that uh, affect the, the person's cognitive functions. So yeah, the functions, how the brain works, how quick it uh, works, how, to, yeah, how quick it, you can take decisions, um, how good they are, how, how quick you can react to 
stimuli from from outside how how quick your thoughts is for example so yeah ex actually how how your brain works so one of the conclusions they made was that the cognitive function of the brain increased uh, quite a bit when the breathing was performed through the nose so for you who are thinking about having a septoplasty or turbulent reduction you must understand this it's extremely important a surgery to your nose is not only a surgery locally in your nose it's a surgery to your nervous system and to your brain and that surgery if too much um, tissue damage um, is caused there will be consequences irreversible consequences to your health um, to your sleep to your stress levels to your yeah relaxation and of course this is related through the stimuli of the thermoreceptors because breathing through the mouth should be better actually because you can get more air if you breathe through your mouth through your, through your mouth so it's it's related to these receptors and if you don't stimulate these receptors it will affect your your mind and your nervous system and your brain this is another scientific article i found about the empty nose syndrome and the connection to the limbic system so again it just says that uh, if your turbinates and your nose is um, damaged so that the senses or function is damaged there will be no signal sent to the um, to the brain uh, via the fifth cranial nerve and that causes a distress among the patients if we go down one step to the scientific study one here uh, they could see after no surgery and uh, that there were some changes to the aerodynamics inside the nose and they made the conclusion that this is part of the reasons for empty nose syndrome but one part was also the um, sensory reason where those receptors get damaged and unfortunately they say like most doctors say uh, it could be predisposing conditions uh, behind this condition and that's just fucking bullshit i hate to hear that and it's not true and uh, any anyone can get this condition it just depends on how much damage you will get on your nasal uh, uh, turbinate and on the septum it's just one way for the doctors for the healthcare industry and healthcare system to transfer the responsibility uh, for these conditions to the patients and to yeah to transfer it for the patients and be out of responsibility themselves and one more below here uh, scientific study two empty nose syndrome and so yeah they also say that um, alterations in the local environment in the nose disruption of mucosal cooling uh, that's the thermoreceptors they are talking about and disruption of the sensory uh, functions in the nose so there are quite a lot of studies and i haven't been looking at all the studies but there are a lot of proof and we don't need more proof these kind of surgeries they affect your whole organism your whole nervous system your brain and it's not just surgery locally in your nose and that's something doctors won't mention to you okay a uh, new side of the slideshow here it's also a new day for me recording uh, i haven't been doing any recording on this now for um, like one and a half week i have slept so extremely bad uh, i have a i had a lot of problems with air hunger uh, been waking up like after two or three hours uh, so i i'm totally exhausted so i'm just going to show you this um, 
this is how how my sleep was a couple of days uh, before today and i fell asleep around one o'clock you can see where the purple area is here uh, and i woke up around three o'clock and then i was awake the whole night here of course i know i've been listening to a few podcasts um, so i slept two hours uh, and this is no normally how it works uh, i use decongestion spray in my good left nostril to force that side to stay open and um, i take sleeping pill and then i fell asleep uh, normally quite quick uh, but i wake up like in two or three hours um, then i have the shift from my good left nostril to my bad um, right nostril so my good uh, left nostril is now completely blocked i only have the airflow through my right nostril and this is the airflow this is the side where i don't have any air feel so when i wake up <clears throat> i have high pulse i have um, high stress levels um, yeah i don't feel relaxed at all and i have air hunger uh, suffocation breathing problems uh, how you say it uh, so this this image on the right side uh, it's from my watch here uh, it matches hrv so it matches your stress level <clears throat> and um, you can see here that my stress levels uh, the whole day is pretty high up to 85 and um, most of the time it's above 35 around 40 so if we look like a normal day um, or a normal day it's not a normal day but a day when I can force my left nostril to keep open um, this is how my stress levels looks like it's below 40 most of the time and uh, yeah it's pretty often above uh, below 20 and you can see this is another day yeah below 40 most of the time around 20 so yeah the, here you can see clearly how it affects my my breathing if i can force my good nostril left nostril to keep open i feel so much better the problem now is i have i have been using so much decongestion spray so it doesn't work anymore i spray like 30 40 times and it doesn't open up anymore so this means i have to breathe through my bad right nostril and that's why i just can't sleep anymore so i'm going to continue now uh, with this page here to explain for you a little bit more uh, about how a surgery to the nose is also a surgery to your brain. The study I have been looking on is this one, alteration in the nasal cycle rhythm as an index of the deceased condition. And the link is here. I'm too tired to read up everything. And I've been talking about the nasal cycle before. Uh, so you can just pause it and read it yourself. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight here and um, talk about a few really interesting conclusions from this study I think it's important that you know about before deciding to have surgery to your nose or not um, and for example they found out that when you breathe through your right nostril uh, you will have one increased glucose level in your body which means that you will also have more energy more insulin will be pumped into the um, cells in the body uh, and you will have one increased energy level so the opposite um, matters when you breathe through your left nostril you will have a decreased glucose level in the blood and also a decreased energy level in your body so this should be a, like a natural shift the body should be like speeding up a little bit more, being more active, and then it should shift. Uh, and that is regulated by the um, by um, hypothalamus. Um, so yeah, this shift when you when you have one side or both sides of the nasal uh, mucosa destroyed, this shift won't uh, won't function. If you have damaged those thermoreceptors, um, yeah, the brain will not get this signal and 
yeah, it can affect your blood glucose levels. Uh, another thing is that uh, breathing through your right nostril activates the left part of your brain, the left hemisphere of the brain. And this part of the brain is more um, involved in um, processing um, when being active when um, yeah, it's responsible for logical thinking and when you breathe through your other nostril when you breathe through your left nostril this act activates the right hemisphere of the brain and this side is more responsible for creative thinking and, and you can read uh, more about the right and the left hemisphere of the brain yourself and you can find out that it yeah it, it's a big difference um, what each part do or not do um, yeah and another thing they found out is um, when the turbinates congest they secrete more mucus um, so when you have uh, more mucus produced you also have uh, better protection against uh, dryness you have um, some substances in the mucus like lactoferrin and um, IgA antibodies uh, that are antibacterial and antiviral so you get the protection from the from from virus and bacteria so if you destroy or remove your turbinates uh, you will have a, a immune system in the nose that is heavily reduced so that's another thing um, they also realized that um, the nasal cycle is related to um, catecholamines, um, the level of catecholamines in the body. Um, and those are um, like the stress hormones in your body. So yeah, I'm not going to say uh, much more uh, about, uh, about this study. Um, just that you have to realize, I've been saying this so many times before, I'm going to say it one time again a surgery to your nose is not a surgery locally in your nose only it's a surgery to your nervous system and to your brain so let's continue with the last um, scientific study here the study i have been looking on is this one and the aim of the study was to evaluate uh, if slow breathing could affect um, cognition and relaxation. So before I start to talk about the conclusions from the study, I want to mention something that is well known um, among us patients who have empty nose syndrome. Um, so if you remove too much of your turbinates or if you remove them totally or if you remove cartilage from your septum or destroy the uh, vasodilation function of the septal mucosa so that mucosa can't swell up anymore the nose will become a lot more open so your natural air resistance will not be there anymore this means that you will have a more shallow breathing uh, and a more rapid breathing. So more breath per minute and less deep breath. So this is partly a reason for um, breathing problems among patients who have empty nose syndrome. Some people have uh, mostly thermo receptor related problems where the, those thermal receptors are gone some people have more problems related to just lack of air resistance and if you have uh, problems lack of air resistance you're in a better position because then you could probably add some cartilage um, implants in your nose and fix the problem at least a bit but if you have uh, the damage to your thermal receptors like i have yeah it's not really much you can you can do about it so let's continue uh, to look on uh, the conclusions from the study so the first one here if one breathes um, slowly 
uh, at a frequency near 0 0.1 hertz, so six breaths per minute. That uh, promotes relaxation and it also um, maximizes the heart rate variability. So it maximizes the HRV and if you have a higher HRV you are more tolerant to stress. So if we go back and look in my case, uh, I have a low HRV which means I get a high score on the stress levels here. So they also write here that a reduced HRV um, is related to stress, uh, stress related disorders including anxiety, depression and epilepsy. Next point, they found out that uh, relaxa relaxation techniques uh, that involves slow deep breathing have shown to help conditions of cardiorespiratory and stress related disorders including chronic heart failure, hypertension, uh, so high blood pressure, uh, anxiety and depression. Something more they discovered is that uh, the tidal volume and the respiratory rate are known to have relations to behavioral and emotional state. So for example, if you breathe with high volume of inhaled air, so a high tidal volume, and at the same time have a low respiratory rate, this uh, improves um, how you can handle stress. So you will become more relaxed if you breathe slowly uh, and less often. And opposite uh, matters if you breathe fast uh, and shallow. Uh, this will trigger anxiety. So yeah. And lastly they found out that uh, slow nasal respiration uh, can enhance memory function um, when, yeah, when tried uh, among humans. So that's everything I want to say about uh, this study. You can read more uh, yourself if you want to. So I'm pretty much done with my presentation here. Uh, so I, I just want to say to you Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay away from the turbinator. And the, the turbinates are the breathing organs of your body. They affect uh, the nervous system, they affect your brain. Uh, if you destroy them, it will affect your personality, uh, it will affect your sleep, it will affect your stress levels. Uh, it will affect how your brain works, how, how good you can um, act to outer stimuli, um, how quick you can take decisions. Uh, yeah, it will affect your whole life. So uh, with this, I just want to say that um, think over this over and over and over again try to find um, other people who did this surgery, talk to them, because if you talk to the surgeons, they will not tell you uh, what can happen. And they, and they don't know and they don't care. So my life was destroyed from this surgery. It's basically over. I'm going to suffer for the rest of my life. Um, my sleep is going to be like three, four hours each night. So. The only thing I want to have out from this, I don't earn any money at all. Um, I have nothing to, to, to gain from, from this rather than uh, I want you to rethink if you really need a nasal surgery. And think what happened to me and think what happened to other people and decide whether you want to have this surgery or not.
So lastly, uh, if you like this video and if you want to share it to other people, if you want it to, if you want it to be spread, uh, please uh, like or subscribe the video. It helps uh, YouTube a lot to, to spread the video to, to other viewers. So yeah, that's everything for me. Uh, I wish you uh, a good and unhappy life.